Welcome to Norse Code, the number one podcast for your Minnesota Vikings. I am your host and producer. My name is James Pagoshnik. Thank you guys so much for listening. And at the other end of the tin can and string, we have our analyst and co-host. You know him from numerous blogs and podcasts, including theathletic.com. He is useful human Arif Hassan. Arif, we have our Pro Bowl special. Are you ready for the snubs? Yeah, let's talk about People love talking about snubs. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Um, before we get into the Pro Bowl stuff, let's just uh, knock this out quick. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. If you enjoy the show and would like to donate to the show or hear value in what we produce twice a week, you can go to patreon.com slash Norse code or you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code and make a one-time donation to the show. Patreon is obviously more of a uh, subscription-based product. Uh, side note, I'm going to need to remember to redo the ending. Uh, of the show because it still says Patreon on it uh, back before every person in New York corrected me um, on it. So <laughs> I, uh, I am going to have to redo that at some point. Somebody nag me into doing it, please. Uh, so again, if you enjoy the show, hear value in what we produce, uh, patreon.com slash Norse code, or you can go to paypal.me slash Norse code as well. Um, let's uh, actually one more thing before we, go into the Pro Bowl uh, snubs, madness, and whatnot, uh, I am going to be sending out the uh, packages for the second half of the Patreon uh, donors. So you, if you uh, if you were a, th- a Tree Fitty uh, subscriber, you will be receiving that shortly. Uh, just waiting to actually receive the rest of it in the mail, and then we can send, the, uh, send that out to you. So also, I am about to begin the arduous task of putting together the end-of-the-year clip show. So if there is something you would like to hear from the year, uh, if you have a request, go ahead and uh, send it over to NorseCodePodcast at gmail.com or just uh, tweet the Norse Code uh, Twitter account and I will take a look at it there. All right, let's get into the madness. Let's get into the snubs. The three Vikings that made the Pro Bowl this year are Harrison Smith, Daniil Hunter, and Delvin Cook, who got the most uh, votes for any running back this year. Uh, I believe, for, was it just the NFC or was it the uh, the entirety of the NFL? NFL, but uh, certainly I think he got the most uh, for sure in the NFC because we saw the the leading vote getters yeah. uh, the night before the recording and he was the leading vote getter in the NFC. They had the vote total so I could just quickly double check, but it's not worth it. Devin Cook made it. We knew he was going to make it. He deserves to make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, fantastic job uh, for Dalvin. Daniel Hunter deserves to make it. Uh, we were really confident he was going to make it. He was not being vote getter. I think it was Nick Bosa, uh, for the NFC among defensive ends. I totally understand that. Um, but yeah, uh, it, that, that all makes sense. Uh, Harrison Smith, uh, it, it's kind of interesting because we remember the case a couple of years ago where he missed the Pro Bowl, made the All Pro. And so there's just been this kind of idea that Harrison Smith just hasn't been getting his due, generally speaking. So mm-hmm. it was kind of, I'm not going to say it's always a toss up whether or not he makes the Pro Bowl, but it's always a pleasant surprise. So well, we had, people uh, had the good. people had the pitchforks and torches out last year. <laughs> like, yeah. like, how dare you snub our Harrison Smith? Have you not watched Harry the Hitman? Have you not watched Satan's Crowbar? <laughs> right, <laughs> brutal, right? Uh, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad Harrison Smith make it. We shouldn't overlook that because it is not a guarantee uh, that Smith makes it. And honestly, you know, he's not having the year that he uh, had when he made it as an All Pro. Uh, so uh, it, it's kind of funny that it, it was this year that he made it. Um, in a year when the Vikings defense is down, he's not playing uh, to the level that he was playing as an All Pro. Uh, but you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> uh, he he gets his uh, he gets his Pro Bowl honor. He probably. I wouldn't imagine he gets the All Pro honor. I'm not confident, but uh, we'll see. There's still a little bit of season left. All right, let's get into the snubs because that's the only thing that people really care about. Um, on the Vikings, you could argue that Kirk Cousins has had a better year than Aaron Rodgers. You could argue it actually pretty easily. <laughs> um, so you take a look at any number of, of various quarterback metrics. Um, so you can look at expected points, which I think is kind of the most contemporary way to view, uh, production. It's not as in the mainstream as, uh, as, as a bunch of other ways to evaluate quarterbacks, but it is from a production standpoint, probably the best one because it takes into account things like down and distance and stuff like that. Um, for people unfamiliar with expected points, which I can't imagine, uh, there's a ton of people who listen to this podcast regularly that don't because I love the stat. I talk about it a lot. Uh, the idea just behind it is, uh, there's a certain number of points, uh, NFL teams score on average 
from every field position and every down and distance. And that gets smoothed out, but you take, you know, the past couple of years of, of, of NFL data and figure out kind of, oh, on average teams score, you know, this many points. And uh, we have to take into account things like interceptions and stuff like that. So uh, on average, you know, opposing teams score this much and then, uh, you know, and then it's an iterative process. So um, the expected points, for example, of having the ball on third down on your own one yard line is like negative two or something like that, because uh, there's some chance of a safety, but mostly there's a there's a really high chance of a punt. And so that's negative expected points. So it does take into account how likely it is the other team's going to score from your field position as well, uh, based on how likely it is you can give the ball away. So all of that in mind, it takes into account, you know, the fact that, you know, seven yards on, on third and eight is just not that helpful. Uh, it takes into account the fact that, uh, you know, Hail Mary interceptions are just, it doesn't matter. Right. Um, so that, I mean, which is all great. Like uh, a deep interception uh, is treated differently in expected points than a short interception. Uh, fumbles are penalized pretty heavily. Uh, if they're lost, they don't usually differentiate between fumbles lost and, and, and all fumbles, which, uh, is not a, I, w- I would argue is a knock on the system, but whatever. It's it's probably the best production oriented way. We have to look at quarterbacks and Cousins vastly outstrips Aaron Rodgers. It's not particularly close. Aaron Rodgers is in the middle of the pack, uh, no pun intended, uh, of all quarterbacks in EPA. It's not great, but there's a bunch of other ways to look at it. QBR, which primarily uses expected points as an input, uh, has Cousins and and Dak Prescott, who also didn't make it, way ahead of Aaron Rodgers. Um, personally, I think that. Uh, it should have been Prescott and Cousins in over Rodgers and Breeze. I understand why Breeze made it. Breeze statistically is having a really wonderful season. I just think he just hasn't played enough. Um, he missed five games. Uh, and so I would argue his impact on the field has just not been enough. Um, so I, I don't really like that, that Breeze made it, but I understand it. Um, but yeah, uh, Cousins beats out Aaron Rodgers in, uh, I'm pretty confident in, in PFF grade as well. He also beats him out in yards per attempt, adjusted net yards per attempt, uh, which take into account touchdowns, interceptions, and sacks taken. Um, any, really, any way that you evaluate a quarterback, uh, Cousins is way ahead of Rodgers. So the fact that Rodgers made it uh, is, is is really disappointing, and not because, you know, this is a Vikings podcast that wants to hate on the Packers, because I think it's cool when you go up against an opponent that that has a bunch of really good players that are recognized for being as good players and you beat them um i i just don't think uh you know people who who don't like have the year they need to have in order to make the pro bowl um should be in but yeah cousins has been having a phenomenal season i wrote a piece at the athletic about the ways to use advanced statistics uh, statistics to evaluate offensive players in particular quarterbacks and it is really tough to look past the production that Dak Prescott, who's even having even better year than, than Russell Wilson, who also made it uh, and deserves to make it. Um, Dak Prescott's having the best year of any NFC quarterback and he didn't make it. Um, y- you take a look at the statistical impact that these quarterbacks have had. And even when you discount certain elements, like, you know, Dak gets Amari Cooper and Cousins gets Diggs. Uh, I mean, and Rogers gets Devonta Adams, right? And, and Breeze gets Michael Thomas and Russell Wilson gets, I guess Tyler Lockett. That's not as impressive, but fine. And not um, uh, not Josh Gordon anymore. <laughs> yeah, not Josh Gordon anymore. It was a good four games or whatever. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, DK Metcalf, Tyler Lockett are back. But they, it takes into account you, most ways that we look at it. We'll take into account, you know, hey, they've got these receivers, they've got this offensive line. Um, yeah, Rodgers has just not been that good this year. I mean, he certainly every single game he'll put together a bunch of really good plays. They don't tend to be as impactful over the course of the game as kind of the regular plays that he misses. He's been missing just open receivers short and intermediate. He's not making the right decisions uh, down the field uh, that he needs to be making. He holds onto the ball too long. He fights pressure. Uh, the Packers have the second highest pass block win rate among their offensive line, which means that within the first two and a half seconds or so, uh, their offensive linemen are winning at the line of scrimmage more than almost any other offensive line group in the league. But he's holding onto the ball so long that he's inviting a bunch of pressure and he's making the offensive line look bad, which is a traditional problem for him. He had that problem in 2010 and he kind of overcame it in in 2011 and so on. But uh, in, in, in those years, he more than made up for it. You know, he was remarkable. Obviously 2011 is one of the best quarterback seasons from uh, anybody we've seen in a long time, like rivals, 2004 Peyton Manning, just really remarkable stuff. 
Um, he obviously he more than made up for it with his plays downfield. He here he's not making up for it. Uh, he's just not hitting his receivers as often as he needs to. Um, obviously he hasn't thrown a bunch of interceptions. I think it's only three. Uh, dropped one last week against the Bears. Unfortunately, it would have been nice to add that to the total. But um, yeah, he's avoiding interceptions, but at the cost of giving up tons and tons and tons of yards on the field. So uh, his yards per attempt is really low uh, because he is playing such risk averse football that he's just not taking shots or opportunities downfield. His expected points are low uh, because he's not converting and creating new first downs as often as other quarterbacks are. Um, and and there's there's another side to it, right? Like Jameis Winston is usually among the league leaders in first down rate. You would never put him in the in the Pro Bowl based off of that because of his turnover potential. So there's obviously a point where where turnovers uh, overcome the the value of first downs. But uh, Rodgers is not at the inverse of that. He's not at that point. We can measure that by things like expected points and see kind of what the value of which is. And he just isn't doing it. Um, if he threw four more interceptions this year, but also threw downfield a lot more and completed you know, a bunch of passes downfield, that would be more than worth it in terms of, you know, offensive point production. The Packers, obviously, they're winning, and that, I think, is playing a pretty big part, but uh, the offense has just not been that great. The Packers have been kind of lucky in close games. Um, it's, you know, I'd, I'd rather play the Packers uh, than almost any other playoff team, the Cowboys included. Obviously, they'd be kind of uh, my preferred choice for a, a Vikings opponent, but uh, unlikely to happen unless the Vikings kind of, Unless the Vikings like lose out and, well, and all that, so yeah, yeah we, we can talk about that later. But yeah, Cousins uh, absolutely should have made it in over Rodgers, if not Cousins. Certainly Prescott, who's had an even better year, uh, ridiculous. Uh, and I understand, like you know, we'll, we'll talk about the value of the Pro Bowl in a second. But uh, I understand, like the name recognition plays a really big role. Plus, he's had some highlights this year that were legitimately wonderful. Uh, he's made throws this year that it's very difficult to see other quarterbacks making. Uh, he is a highlight machine, but the problem is kind of in between those highlights, he just hasn't been doing enough. Yeah. And the next one that uh, we should probably mention is Eric Kendricks. Yeah, so Eric Kendricks has played, I think, even better than, uh, you know, Cousins. I understand this one a little bit more uh, because it is just more difficult to evaluate or measure defensive play and put it all together into a context that uh, allows you to rank defensive players unless it's at like a pass rusher position. Um which is probably why they got like Daniel Hunter right, but they didn't get Eric Kendricks right. Um, th- this one makes sense because the the two inside linebackers that made it from the NFC are Luke Keekley and uh, Bobby Wagner. And so if you say Kendricks is a snub, who do you have to take off? Uh, I think Keekley has once again been uh, arguably the best linebacker in the NFC uh, along with Kendricks. So I would take Bobby Wagner off, which is uh, a weird thing to say, but you know he's not having as high a level a year as he typically does. Um, I think most years, you know, Bobby Wagner uh, deserves to make it. Uh, he's an incredible linebacker. and He's having a good year, but he's not having uh, a great year. Um, and and Kendricks is having a great year. Uh, he's really phenomenal in terms of run stops. I think he leads all linebackers in run stops. He's one of the league leaders in pass deflections. Uh, you know, what's interesting is that he often gets very difficult coverage assignments downfield. And so uh, you can actually, I, I did this a couple weeks ago, you can correct for how difficult the coverage assignment is for a linebacker based off of the depth of, of, of target that they have to defend and kind of adjust for how many yards per route run that uh, or, or snap and coverage that linebacker would be expected to give up based on how difficult their assignment is. And uh, once you do that, Kendricks is, I think, up there with Joe Schobert, um with the Browns. Uh, in terms of in terms of coverage capability, so uh, he's one of the best coverage linebackers in the league right now. He's uh, one of the best run defender linebackers in the league. I think he has beaten out Bobby Wagner this year in both run defense and coverage, uh, and so it, he should make it above Bobby Wagner. He's having a remarkable year. He's playing at an All Pro level, and he absolutely deserves that kind of recognition. Uh, and and he didn't get it, and and that sucks. What about uh, Stefan Diggs? Does he have a case? That one's tougher. <laughs> um, the NFC is super stacked at receiver. Michael Thomas right now is playing like he's the best receiver in the NFL. So he's in the NFC. So he just makes it. Four receivers make it. Um, Mike Evans and Chris Godwin are having really, really remarkable years. Uh, and I think they lead fantasy leaderboards. So, uh, I, I get why they made, made it. And, and they're, uh, they're both just really good. Julio Jones is having a really good year. Interestingly, he's also having a down year for him. Um, unlike with Rodgers and Wagner, 
in this case, a down year for Julio Jones still means one of the top years uh, for a receiver on the NFC in terms of yards per out run. Typically, Julio is first in yards per out run by a pretty hefty margin. Um, and so him having a down year this year, he's still, I think, top five in yards per out run. So uh, good for him. Uh, I understand. But I would argue that Dix has played better than uh, either Mike Evans or Julio Jones. Um, you do have to take into account the fumbles and the drops. And, and if that's a reason somebody would prefer to have, you know, Mike Evans or Julio Jones, which is it's just easier to, to put them in anyway, because uh, they've got uh, elite production kind of behind them over the course of their career. So it's pretty easy to put them in anyway. Um, I get it. Uh, you know, the, the fumbles and, and created interceptions, uh, have put him kind of behind in terms of total production, I think, from some of these other receivers. But I would argue, you know, he's had a better year. I would put in Chris Godwin's over Mike Evans, uh, Godwin's, Godwin over Mike Evans. Uh, but Diggs is the leader, the singular leader in yards per out run, which is, uh, maybe the most stable and certainly the most useful, I think, receiver stat. He's doing it in a year where, uh, you know, they, they haven't had Adam Thielen for seven games. Uh, and, and he's had really, really remarkable games. Uh, whereas at least Mike Evans and Chris Godwin have each other. At least Julio Jones has Calvin Ridley, who's having a pretty good year. Um, and then Michael Thomas doesn't have anybody. And again, I'm not contesting Michael Thomas's place. So that kind of makes sense. But I would argue that Diggs has a better case. Then uh, Julio has a better case than Mike Evans, has a better case than Chris Godwin. Uh, but that one is another situation, almost like Kendrick's, where I get it. I, it's who do you cut, right? So that one's where that one's where it's like difficult because that's just what it means to play uh, in the NFC. That's kind of the problem with Pro Bowl and the conference adjustments, uh, so or the conference restrictions. Uh, so I, I get it. Um, Diggs probably should have gotten in over one of those three. Uh, I would say over Mike Evans, but uh, I I get it. Um, but I mean, he, he just had a, a really crazy good year. Maybe uh, if he converted some of those 80 yard shots into touchdowns instead of getting down to the one like Calvin Johnson did so many times, you know, he probably would have made it because touchdown numbers seem to drive a lot of these votes. But um, I don't know, he got he got downfield a bunch. He got open a bunch. He did it without uh, for most of the year uh, at, at this point, literally the majority of, of the games they've played uh, without the support of uh, another high level receiver. Um but yeah, I'm kind of surprised I'm not arguing uh, about Devonta Adams. But again, yeah. super rich year for NFC receivers, so I get it. Uh, what about Anthony Harris over Buda Baker? Yeah, th- I don't love that. Um, Buda Baker is like the 46th, 46th rated safety by PFF, um, I, which I don't love the safety rankings that PFF does. It's usually pretty helpful for the Vikings because the safeties tend to show up on the broadcast footage a lot and they tend to make impact plays a lot on the broadcast footage because they they alternate them, put them near the line of scrimmage a lot. Uh, and so there's just more opportunities to generate a positive PFF grade. And it, it hurts like, you know, free safeties like, uh, you know, like Eric Weddle or something, or, or uh, I guess Earl Thomas too. Um, but uh, in this case, uh, I, I just, I don't see it for Buda Baker. You know, I get he has like tackle numbers and stuff, but that, I mean, that's absurd. Uh, Anthony Harris, I think, is the interception leader in the NFL. If not, he's the interception leader among safeties. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I don't, I don't get Buda Baker. That one doesn't make any sense to me. The other safety is fine. Uh, obviously, one of them is Harrison Smith, so you can't contest that one too much. But, I mean, I feel like Anthony Harris has been having a better year than Harrison Smith. Uh, and so this should have been like kind of like a Kevin Byard year where, uh, you know, there's safety that not many people have heard of because of, uh, and he's been playing with the world, but because of his absurd interception numbers, uh, ends up making it in. Um, this could be another case, could be another Viking safety that uh, sneaks away into an all-pro team, although I doubt it this time just because he's competing with uh, Harrison Smith on the same team. Yeah, I, I think that one's, I'm not going to say it's egregious. I just think it's so obviously the case that he should make it above Buda Baker, but it's, you know, it's difficult to get people to recognize the other Viking safety. And, of course, C.J. Ham clearly should have made it. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> he's having a really good year. There's no way he's going to make it in over Kyle Juszczyk. Um, when, when the Monday Night Football broadcast talks about how great this fullback is, that's it. That guy's making the Pro Bowl. They don't do it more than twice. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, he wasn't going to make it over Kyle Juszczyk. And I think Juszczyk is more valuable, too, so. That's tough. He's a better blocker, I guess. He's been having a much better year as a blocker. Um, 
He's a yak machine, but <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, if you're going to mention yak machines, we, you know, Laquan Treadwell oh, yeah. could have been out there as a holder, but. And Kyle Rudolph. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, and then, you know, the outside linebacker position is, is always posted. I, I hate it so much. It's such an I, odd I, way that they decide to represent it. Well, yeah. So, like. I understand why, because that's the official position designation for the NFL, but like, and, and it's an NFL product, but just like, stop. The, the Pro Bowl, like, I'll talk about how much the Pro Bowl matters, but the only reason that the Pro Bowl does matter is in, in how it recognizes, uh, players, right? Like, in, 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 in the award it, it, it provides. No one gives a shit about the game, right? But the award that you get from the Pro Bowl, from a Pro Bowl selection, is is what matters, and so to to pit, yeah, Anthony Barr or uh, KJ Wright or you know another outside linebacker uh, like Levante David to pit those guys. I guess Levante David was on the inside linebacker ballot this year, but I think he's been on the outside linebacker ballot in previous years. To pit those guys against, I think the NFC outside linebackers are Shaquille Barrett and Khalil Mack and like another pass rusher. Like, come on, man. They're edge players. We should have edge players play against edge players in this competition. They should be voting against edge players so that they have the same job and that we can evaluate them doing the same job. Otherwise, I mean, like Clay Matthews made it in uh, at outside linebacker for a couple of years and, and, he, and he crowded out some really good uh, linebackers. Like, I mean, the year that Chad Greenway should have made it. Uh, 2009, he ended up making it in 2010, but in 2009, you know, I think, uh, you know, Matthews made it in over Greenway and that was absurd. Um, but you know, Greenway, like when you go to the Pro Bowl voting page on the NFL page, it lists like sacks and tackles, which is just, it forces us to emphasize total t- tackle numbers, which I've talked about in the past, totally awful. It forces us to emphasize sacks, which is like just not the job of a lot of these outside linebackers who are playing basically the same position as like Eric Hendricks, right? And so uh, Zadarius Smith and Shaquille Barrett and some other pass rusher end up making it for the NFC, and you don't get to evaluate, you know, the outside linebackers that are playing linebacker. And at the same time, you make it easier for the defensive ends who now get to go up against a couple of defensive tackles playing defensive end, but mostly just go up against a depleted field of edge rushers. And so this year, it didn't really affect things because uh, Nick Bosa and Daniel Hunter were the best edge rushers in the NFC. So that makes sense. So Darius Smith had a really remarkable season. Phil Mack uh, didn't have as great a season as he typically does, but pretty remarkable. Um, and, and they would have made it over those two. But, you know, most years, you know, you're taking Khalil Mack and Von Miller out of the edge rusher pool uh, and, and getting, you know, some defensive ends get to compete on that level. And that's absurd. Uh, so, yeah, know, fix it, man. Just have off-ball linebackers and edge players the way I think the, the all-pro voting does now, uh, which, I mean, it took them a long time to do that, but that's way better. I, I, I can't believe that. Um, so... Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So pe- whenever I get upset about the Pro Bowl, people are like, oh, Reef, the Pro Bowl doesn't matter. The voting is broken. That no one watches the game. They should cancel the game. And I get all of that. Uh, but I, I think it matters because the, the whole idea behind this is that we recognize who the best players are. And we don't have a ton of avenues to recognize and give awards to the best players at their position. And we're so used to the system being broken that we just accept that it's broken and tell ourselves to move on. And that's ridiculous. Like the only, <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm just enjoying the, uh, you know, the, 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 the speech now of like, we have to do this. We have to change. Otherwise, if we don't change, we'll it'll always be the same. And listen, and our listeners just going, yeah, I'll run through a wall for that. Let's go. Let's change the <laughs> Pro Bowl voting. <laughs> Screw impeachment. Nothing else is important down. right now. We need to <laughs> fix the Pro Bowl. And, and here's the thing. I have no idea how to fix it from a voting perspective. <laughs> uh, because that's that's another problem. I, I'll get mad about it every year. And I have no idea how to fix it. Because uh, with the fan vote, so it's a third fan voting, a third player voting, and a third coach voting, I think. Um, and there's already sort of a media voting which is the all pro which uh, that's just the associated press i'd really like it if like a broader cross-section of media could vote not just because it would mean i would get a vote 
it would mean that, which would be dope. But uh, also, I mean, like the people at PFF and the people who work at like USA Today and the people who work at the NFL Network get to vote on the All Pro, like and, and and like local beat writers. Like I think that all makes sense. Like local beat writers have an impact on the Hall of Fame voting, but they don't get a vote for All Pros. Weird. And I'm not saying like the Associated Press is screwed up. That it's their own internal award, and it just so happens that because the UPI doesn't do it, and the Sporting News I don't think does it anymore. Uh, that the only all pro that we recognize is the Associated Press one. I, I get it. Like the more power to them. I'm not saying they shouldn't be able to vote on their own friggin' all pro or I'm saying we should have another, uh, all pro that's, that's kind of more media based. And I don't think that should be the Pro Bowl, but you know, players are just awful at voting, right? And which we, when we look at the NFL 100, uh, every year, which now it's difficult to distinguish that between the NFL 100 team and the nfl like 100 every year the ranking of the top 100 players they still need, they sucks. still need the hater 100 that's, yeah that's that's yeah. Oh, clear. so good it would be way better um but yeah that demonstrates that players are not particularly great at, at voting for other players and uh fans tend to vote for players that receive the most promotion and it, what time are coaches spent? They're not pro scouts. They're coaches. They're coaching their own players. You know, the only film they watch are the, are the films of either their own players, their upcoming opponents, and it creates a skewed perspective. Uh, there's no good voting system, but certainly, um, whatever it is now is just so fundamentally broken. Um, the fact that there's not like a way to at least inhibit people flooding ballots, like you can vote via Twitter. And you can vote as many times online as you want. Like, at least make people, like, register an email address or something. That's absurd. Uh, or even, like, more uh, invasive, I guess. It would be, like, a phone number. Um, and not that the NFL would, like, if you said do it by phone number and you'd say, yeah, but you'd have to promise not to, like, sign people up for, like, text messages or, or spam. Yeah, I wouldn't trust the NFL not to do that. So, uh, a lot of problems with that. But if we're talking about ideal worlds, like, that would be kind of one way to do it. But yeah, I, 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 the reason I care about the Pro Bowl is because we just don't have ways to recognize the best at every position in, in very meaningful ways that a lot of people get to be, get to be involved with. The process is broken, like I'm talking about with like the outside linebacker and the defensive end thing. Um, but also it affects contracts. It affects like the financial incentives players get to earn. Like now Eric Hendricks probably doesn't get a bonus. I don't really know how the bonus works with alternates or whatever. And he's almost certainly an alternate. I know he was a top eight vote getter in the NFC, um, which I mean, the way they kind of whittled down uh, to the, he's probably going to end up getting it in. But uh, I don't know if alternates meet that contract incentive. I assume no. Um, But then it also affects like Hall of Fame voting, which I don't think Hendricks is like a risk to make the Hall of Fame or anything like that. But it it determines how we feel about these players in a bunch of ways. And so uh, when Anthony Barr was negotiating with the New York Jets and fleecing them before coming back to Minnesota, almost certainly his agent said he was a four time pro bowler, which was not an accurate assessment of his ability or at least his production at all. Right. Because two of those years that he made the Pro Bowl, he was just not that good. And last year when he made the Pro Bowl, I wouldn't have put him in. Uh, he had a, he had a really good year last year. So he, he should have made the Pro Bowl like one of his four years. Right. Uh, and, but he gets to be a four time Pro Bowler. Uh, and it affects contract negotiations. And like I said, it affects the actual language of the contracts, the incentive structure that kicks in. Uh, and, and now Kendrick's is not going to get it. Um, but just honestly, I, th- I just think that generally speaking, if we have an award system, we should strive to make it meaningful in some way instead of just talking about how it's like we just take it on face that the Pro Bowl sucks. And it's like, don't get mad about it because, uh, you know, it, it doesn't matter. We know it's a popularity contest. Like, I, of course, I'm going to be mad about it. Hey, it's my job to talk about football players and I want the right players to get recognition for the right things. Uh, but B, I mean, like these are like real people who like deserve to be recognized for how well they did. If we're talking about an industry or an environment where they get to make twenty million dollars a year or whatever, uh, if that if we accept that on face, and I do because you know it's not like the 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 billionaires are doing the work, right? Um, if we accept that they get to make twenty million dollars or whatever in, in an open market, we should at least accept that they be recognized for how good they are. Uh, and it's absurd that we don't do that, and it's absurd that that it's been so broken for so long that we accept that it's broken. Um, no, if, if, if it's like, if it's part of the, of the discussion about 
the NFL, if, if we're going to talk about more than just who gets to win the Super Bowl every year, if we get to talk about the quality of players, we should recognize which players are quality. Um, the, the times they get it right unexpectedly, like with Kevin Bayard, which, you know, again, is like just one of the rare examples where like, you know, this rookie middle Tennessee state happens to lead the league in interceptions with eight, finally gets it in. Um, or finally gets it in his rookie year, ends up being able to turn that into a pretty big contract. It, it, that happens so rarely, and we're so surprised when they get it right that, uh, you know, we, we let players coast on, you know, how good they've been in the past. Like with Aaron Rodgers, who certainly, you know, was the best quarterback in the NFL for at least a three-year run, and it certainly has put together some of the best quarterback play we've ever seen at the position. And he gets to coast on that instead of, you know, players being recognized for their their capability right now and, and how they did right now. Uh, and some players only have one good year. Um, and so you can't just say, Hey, you know, he'll get in the year after, after you put up this hubbub. And so like, what happened with Chad Greenway? What's probably going to happen with Eric Hendricks? What ended up happening with Harrison Smith? Um, you know, sometimes players only get one good year and they deserve for that year that they played to be recognized for the one good year that they had. And so if they have a really good year and then they get injured the next year, they don't make the Pro Bowl ever. And, uh, that sucks, man. Uh, because they, they put in all this work and they, they had a really good year and they don't get recognized for it in the, again, the only meaningful way that we recognize player accomplishments at the position. And again, the all pro, uh, only recognizes the top player in the NFL. And I think there should be room to recognize the top couple of players in each conference. And the only way that we can do that is the Pro Bowl. And we just screwed up every year. And so I'm going to be mad about it every, I'm going to be mad at the Hall of Fame every year. Um, because, the whole point of this of this endeavor is to recognize the best of the best. And uh, if I can't be mad about who gets it right and who gets it wrong, I mean, then who cares about the sports writing entertainment industry anyway? Just turn off the podcast. I, I just wanted to, you to say so badly. It's my job to be upset about this. Well, yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not disagreeing. And, 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 not, with you. and not like in a Skip Bayless like rage kind of way. <laughs> my well, whole my whole little. stick is. A little bit, but like, I, I don't really like, obviously the clicks pay. Um, so I can't say I don't care about the clicks, but that's not like what's driving this. It's, it's entirely just, I, if I'm supposed to analyze what's happening in football, right? Like the whole point is I'm figuring out, you know, what's working, what's not working from an X and O's perspective, what's working, what's not working, you know, strategically, tactically, you know, how to evaluate the draft. And a big part of it is trying to figure out which players uh, have the biggest impact on the field and who's doing the best job out of everybody. And, uh, my job is to figure out who's doing the best. And if, if we as an industry can't do a very good job of doing that, uh, that reflects a poorly on me, but it means we're just doing a really poor job of educating fans. Right. And, uh, if we're doing that, then, uh, then we're not good at our jobs. So, you know, that sucks. I just wanted to start humming like glory hymn of the Republic there as you were finishing up, just <laughs> bringing a, uh, a full, full charge to order. Well, let's get into, uh, let's get into more Viking centric, uh, news. And the first thing yeah, I want to trap out of the chargers, right? Well, God, the, the, the chargers, uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was in fact a beat them down. Uh, but I want to ask about Delvin cook because Delvin did go down, uh, with an injury and there is kind of speculation as to like whether or not this is like a new area or if this is uh, something that is related to what he was dealing with before from, I believe, the Broncos game. Uh, what's the updated information on Delvin Cook? Um, yeah, so not a ton of updated information, except that there was a report that there's a really good chance Delvin Cook is going to be held out of week 16, week 17. I think Adam Leviton at ESPN, I want to say, uh, reported that. And what's interesting is that um, it may not like matter from the perspective of uh, making the playoffs because if the Rams lose, uh, the Vikings are in the playoffs. So like, why play Delvin Cook? Um, I mean, obviously it, w- it would matter from the perspective of seeding, and I and I think it's pretty important to try and get the best seat possible. But uh, it is kind of funny that um, you know this this comes at quote unquote the right time um, because it it may be the lowest leverage situation for. Uh, the Vikings, but we know it's a different shoulder injury than, uh, the previous injury. Um, you know, Mike Zimmer said it was different. 
uh, there, I, I don't know if I got it as uh, a comment on the athletic article or a question I saw come into Norse code, uh, but somebody asked the question, Hey, how much should we like just trust that, you know, the, when the team says that there was not a risk of re-injury with his current injury, uh, because he got hit in the shoulder again and he is hurt and it seems incredibly unlikely that it ju- it's just an independent injury, right? <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, fair. Um, again, you know, we don't have access to the medical information. And if we did, I would not have the expertise to break it down in any, uh, particularly interesting way that would give us more, uh, light on the topic. Um, but my understanding is that, uh, actually, yes, that might be what happened. Um, that, that, uh, he got injured in a way that actually did not interact with his current, uh, clavicle injury. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Um, but it, it seems like he's probably not going to play. Uh, my guess is he's not playing against the Packers. Sucks, obviously, at like seven and a half yards of carry against them. Um, we'll have to monitor what's happening with, with Alexander Madison and his ankle. Otherwise, we could be entering the game with like Mike Boone and uh, Amir Abdullah, which would really put the running back thing to the test, wouldn't it? Yeah, pretty much. Um, but also, before we kind of go into the uh, Chargers recap, Adam Thielen looked good. Uh, is there any sort of worry about him, or is he officially off the list? Yeah, he's off the list. I mean, he wasn't even on the injury report last week. Uh, obviously, they didn't give him every snap uh, this uh, this last week against the Chargers. Um, they rotated him. I think he had half the snaps. Uh, I'm not sure. But yeah, he looked good. Uh, you know, the Vikings weren't throwing it down the field a ton, so we didn't get to see... I think he got like two targets and two receptions on those targets. Uh, It was a pretty quiet game offensively for the Vikings until the end. And at that point, a lot of people had checked out anyway. Um, But yeah, you know, for the most part, I would say he looked good. It did not look like he was um, slow or anything like that. It did not look like he was playing at a different speed than he typically plays at. So that's really good to see. And I would expect him to once again not be on the injury report and play a heavier rotation of snaps against the Packers. Well, let's get into the Chargers game. And I asked on Twitter after the game, uh, I asked our fans to submit a possible episode title for, for this one as this was a pure beat em down. And uh, the, the, the suggestions that we received, uh, some of them were pretty good. Uh, River of Picks, I liked that. Uh, Bonanza. Uh, my favorite, I think, is Picks Over Rivers Fly. That's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's, that's quite clever. Yeah. Uh, Lights Out in L.A., sure. Uh, the Vikings still haven't beaten a winning team. Uh, <laughs> accurate. <laughs> Takeaways of slash by Vikings at slash from Chargers. Uh, <laughs> turnovers, boondoggle, uh, boon, doggle Chargers. Uh, LA Vikings. Uh, that's a good, I actually, I like that one a lot. Yeah. Uh, Chargers lost their spark or Chargers short circuited. Winning in mm-hmm. Minnesota West. <laughs> uh, shot puts and fumbles because man those right. were just lame ducks uh, US Bank West uh, Vikings home game in LA just like Red McCombs wanted yes that's <laughs> good <laughs> and simply the number 7 this I was like that too, yeah this was a Vikings game that got out of hand quickly for the Chargers uh We've watched this game happen to us before where just everything goes horribly wrong. Like all aspects of the game, you just said like, really, Adrian dropped another? Like how, <laughs> how is this a thing? Oh, and, and Childress got 12 men. Really? Again, 12 men for Childress? Really? And you just sit there like, this is, this is ridiculous. Can we just, you know, you got, you get speed bagged. You're done. Um, but man, this, this was, is ugly. there, is there, is there a, a good pun for lucky number seven or something like that that we could like, cause I like lucky number seven just generally as the, as the headline for the game, but <sighs> it, it, be, like, it should have been there. eight. It should right. have been eight. If not for, I believe Keenan Allen batting a ball that was on the ground to the outside, like, no, <laughs> <laughs> get, get this as far away from a Viking as humanly possible. Well, let's uh, let, let's start with the game, and this is, you know, the first thing that you could say is that the Vikings were very efficient at knocking the ball out 
And I don't know if this was necessarily a tackle perspective, like, like the way they were going at it, or if this was just uh, a bit of luck, but this was a Vikings defense that was all about knocking the ball out. Yeah, so the ability to force fumbles is fairly persistent as a quality of a team. Teams that force fumbles tend to continue to force fumbles. The ability to recover fumbles is, uh, there's a, there's a fair amount of luck involved, right? And so the Vikings had all the fumble luck, essentially, um, or almost all the fumble luck. Um, so that, I mean, that helps that there was a little bit of luck involved, especially on the one that ended up being the Afadi Odenabo, um, run back, right? Because, uh, Austin Eckler picks it up and, and Eric Hendricks knocks it out of his hands. Um, again, right? Uh, so, uh, that, that certainly had a high degree of luck. And if, if Fadi had held on to it initially when he picked it up, he wouldn't have been able to run it back for a touchdown. It just would have been a uh, Vikings ball. So, um, yeah, there, there was a, there was a fair amount of luck involved, but obviously the ability to force all those fumbles, you know, some of that is just, you know, sacks get turned into fumbles. Um, but some of it was just like really great, excellent play. Like Daniel Hunter was clearly attempting to force the fumble on, I think he only forced one. He forced one, recovered one. I don't know. But on the running back, I think it was on Austin Eckler, uh, the fumble that he forced there, um, which I think was the Odenabo touchdown. Um, you know, that I thought was just really heads up play from, from a tackling perspective because he was going for the ball. Um, some of it is just, you know, when you're, when you're, sacking a quarterback sometimes they just lose the ball uh so from that perspective that's a little bit lucky um but yeah there, there's a combination of of really high level play like kendrick's on on eckler part two um and uh and and a little bit of luck uh in terms of the fumble creation from an interception perspective though i mean yeah philip rivers is just making some pretty awful decisions that always helps uh but man anthony harris pick at the end was just phenomenal. He covers the entire field to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the picks were were pretty good. Well, that's the, that's the thing. With luck. You know, Philip Rivers passes this game, and I was as you know as as we started the game, it, they looked like they were being thrown in slow motion. And I don't know if it was just the angle or just the oomph that he was like putting under them, but this seemed like a pass that was in slow motion, and which made it all the more frustrating when he could only, it seemed like he was allergic to converting it uh, unless it was on third down. And so you had right. all of these dumb passes and you could, you could call them, they were, they were lame duck, dumb looking passes that spent forever in the air and they didn't. They finally got to their receiver, and the Viking, usually Mackenzie Alexander, uh, was just sitting there speechless, twiddling his thumbs, like, oh, that, that finally came down. Or, or, uh, uh, what's his name? The, uh, I'm thinking Mike as the cornerback for some reason. I can't seem to think of his last name for some reason. Mike Hughes. Thank you. Mike Hughes, um, also repeatedly got burned for a while until he ended up getting his, uh, until he ended up getting his interception. I've watched a lot of Philip Rivers, and this seemed like the longest <laughs> that the passes had ever stayed in the air. Yeah, what's interesting is I think the Mike Hughes pick might have been one of the better balls, not in terms of accuracy. Obviously, it was pretty inaccurate, and it was obviously a, a terrible decision. But that ball came out of his hand a lot faster than I think a lot of the other. And that would happen like in the fourth quarter too, right? So uh, the fact that that one was kind of one of his – is. Uh, I'm not going to call them fast. They're all knuckleballs, but uh, one of his faster throws uh, was was curious. But you know, Mike Hughes was able to to, to grab it anyway. But yeah, no, it, Rivers just feels like you know someone asked, "Is Philip Rivers done?" I th I think so, probably. You know, I'm I'm not saying that he's not going to play another year. I have no idea if he's going to retire. But I feel like he's been flirting with retirement ever since they moved to L.A. Again, he lives in San Diego. He makes a four hour commute every day to practice. Um, and, uh, he's, he, you know, he's got a driver and, and he's always watching film on the ride, but, um, that's just a brutal work situation. Uh, and so, uh, that plus just playing poorly and all that, uh, I, I would imagine he's going to retire this year, if not next year. Um, but certainly I think this is probably the end of his, uh, career as a as a quarterback that helped carry a team into the playoffs, which he typically has been. Yeah, you have um, to think this is the year that the Chargers seriously look at drafting a quarterback. Yeah, especially with like four or five quarterbacks to be drafted in the first two rounds. Um, so yeah, it, I would I would imagine so. But yeah, he clearly just didn't have 
kind of the zip. The thing that always scared me uh, about Rivers as a quarterback uh, playing against him is that, you know, his release time is so quick. It's so difficult, A, to get a sack on him uh, or B, to anticipate where he's going with the ball because as soon as he winds up, the ball's out. Winds up is a term of art when it comes to Rivers. But as soon as he uh, gets ready to throw the ball, the ball's already out. And so uh, it, it's always difficult for defenders to adjust and, and get to their landmarks in time. And so, you know, the fact that he had pretty good arm strength and pretty good accuracy uh, was uh, boosted by the fact that he got rid of the ball so quickly that, that defenders had a difficult time reacting, um, especially in zone. So, uh, yeah, he, he just doesn't have the accuracy and the arm strength that he had to make that crazy motion work for him in, in, in ways that it does now. And, and he's had like bleed down years in the past. I want to say in 2013 reporters were asking him basically every week, are you playing injured or something? Cause he was having such a bad year that uh, people thought he was going to retire and he didn't. So I want to bring that up and say, it's not, it's not necessarily so that, you know, playing badly means that he's going to continue to play badly. But I, I think he's done just because it's not the same as when, when Brady uh, had a decline in 2013 uh, because it did not look like Brady's uh, arm strength had fallen off in any substantial way. Whereas with Rivers, it, it does look like that. And I think that helped drive a lot of these picks. Like, I don't think Anthony Harris gets that last pick if, if you know, Rivers isn't floating some some throws out there. Yeah. And he had, uh, he had three interceptions. And the first, I, I want to say the first two, just they looked severely underthrown. Uh, they almost looked like the exact same play really uh and then just that that anthony harris interception was just a such a thing of beauty <laughs> it looked like it looked like philip rivers was trying to trick him and anthony harris just found his way right back into the spot in order to pick it off yeah um it was yeah like you said it, it looked like he was trying to like look off uh the safety in which case this this was anthony harris um and I th- he's throwing uh, essentially it looked like a post into cover two, uh, which is typically a winner. <laughs> um, so uh, he's he's kind of throwing against the right coverage, but you're never throwing in the right coverage if the safety knows what you're doing. Like it's always a bad throw if the safety knows exactly where you're going, and and, and Harris seemed to know exactly you know where he was going. Like you know with the the Harrison Smith pick. You know, uh, you know, he had to he had to move from outside the numbers to inside the numbers, but it was inaccurate, and and he was able to poach it and be underneath it. Anthony Harris just had to go up and get it because if he wasn't getting it, the receiver was at least putting a hand on it. Like I don't, it's a tight window, so I don't know if he's gonna actually physically catch it, but he was probably gonna put a hand on it and have a really good chance to catch it. And and Harris just crosses the field, so that was I mean a really remarkable pick. Um, yeah, I don't know. We're, we're, there's a lot of picks to choose from, uh, a lot of turnovers to choose from. Uh, yeah, all pro linebacker Eric Kendricks forced a fumble. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> that was it. Trey Waynes recovers, I think. Um, but yeah, uh, the the Harris pick I think was the most outstanding pick of the day, which is interesting because that one came in garbage time. And actually, uh, Rivers discounted it. Not he wasn't like taking the crap on Anthony Harris or anything like that. He's just like, you know, those last two picks I'm not as upset about because they didn't really affect the outcome of the game, which, uh, yeah, okay, that's fair. I don't see a lot of quarterbacks saying stuff like that, but agreed. Um, But from just a pure, uh, you know, football play standpoint, uh, the athleticism instincts and and technique it took to get that, I thought that was the most impressive one, even though it had, like, the least impact on the game. And Um, obviously the most impactful thing that happened as far as a fumble or an interception would have to be the Odenabo uh, run back for the score. That was yeah. F- first score of his football career, high yep. school, college, uh, NFL. It was fun. I like a big guy touchdown. Big guy touchdowns are fun, and he looked like he was having a blast after that. <laughs> right? Yeah, I think. I th- yeah, he was. He was. He was. Uh, I mean, he's generally a, a pretty fun loving guy. So uh, for him to be able to have something to celebrate just kind of adds to that. Um, I think that's the play where Daniel Hunter goes through the right tackle. I want to say Sam Tevy. And the running back, mm-hmm. uh, he fights for the running back chip. Um, apparently, didn't even know the running back had chipped him. Uh, pokes the ball out on the sack, uh, and then um, Austin Eckler picks it up. Uh, kind of, or Denebo tries to pick it up, doesn't get to it. Austin Eckler tries to pick it up. Eric's, uh, Eric Hendricks pops it out, um, and Denebo picks it up. And uh, somehow, uh, Daniel Hunter gets out in front of Afadi 
even though he's the one that forced the fumble and had to go through two people and hit a third to do it, gets out in front of a Fadi and lead blocks for him and takes out the other tackle. Cleans, uh, just clears the road, completely clears the road for him. And the way that uh, the way that the um, offensive player, I think it was the, the lineman there, uh, the way that he fell backwards after that, it was almost yeah, like oh he God. was even surprised. Like, how did I end up in this spot exactly? Yeah, screw C.J. Ham. Daniil Hunter should have been the Pro Bowl snub at fullback that we talked about. <laughs> Good lord, that uh, that really was quite the block. Um, the big knock on the Vikings this particular game, despite the fact that this turned into a blowout, is that the Vikings weren't able to convert the all of these uh, things, all these turnovers into points, uh, or at least into touchdowns. Most of them turned into field goals, but. Right. This turned into a this turned into a game of why didn't you beat them worse? Like wh- why wasn't why wasn't right. this more of a beatdown? This should have been uh, just judging by the way that the the fumbles and the interceptions came. This should have been over by the by the middle of the or by the beginning of the third quarter. Yeah, and it's it's always difficult to be like yeah the offense would have performed and they took a good scoreboard and they have thirty nine points. But uh, and, and it's primarily a first half problem, right? Because the offense scores 12 points. Um, they end the, the first half, I think, was it 19 to 10 because the Afadi um, touchdown. Um, but, you know, the defense puts them in position to score on two of those drives. So uh, on the on the 19 and, and the 15 or something like that, some crazy field position where you just expect to come down with a touchdown both times or at least one of those times. Uh, and they come away with a field goal both times. Uh, and so they're, they, they have like the opening drive touchdown and then the rest is like field goal. Then they miss the extra point and then the rest is field goals, uh, in the first half. Uh, and so it just really felt like the offense just wasn't getting it done. And then in the second half, uh, not only do they turn some turnovers into touchdowns late, uh, they also march all the way down the field from like the 30 and from the 25, uh, to, to convert those into touchdowns. So, Great offensive showing in the second half. That's kind of what you hope to see. That first half, though, was just like frustrating because they didn't even have the lead for uh, a ton of the first half because uh, after that touchdown uh, they scored and, and got the lead with, uh, they had such difficulty creating additional points that the Chargers actually got out ahead of them 10-9, to 9, and it took that second turnover plus field goal inside the 20. Um, and... I think it, off of those turnovers, the expected point total from an offense on average is about 16, given that field position. Uh, on average, uh, team score 16 points when starting inside, like the, they had one inside the 50 or two inside the, between the 50 and the 40, one inside the 20 and like one inside the 10. Um, and then like, I think maybe one other one. I don't know, but they had five possessions that started inside Chargers territory. And I looked at it for the athletic. I looked at, what are the average number of points a team scores? What are the average number of points a team scores if they're an elite scoring unit? Uh, and on average, team scores 16 points off of that, or yeah, 16 points off of that, and uh, 19 points, uh, no, 19 points off of that, and then 25 if you're an elite offense. Uh, so typically, on average, teams should have scored 19 points in that scenario, 18.7 technically, and then 25 points as an elite offense, and the Vikings scored 16. Uh, and so they underperformed by it, only three points, it seems like, but it kind of adds up. And uh, for the most part, if they're expected to be a really good offense, they should be aiming for that 25, and they fell uh, pretty well short of that off the turnovers. But then again, they scored another 16 points offensively uh, from drives that started inside their own 30. So they made up for it in the second half, uh, plus that first drive, um, later. So on balance, the offense was fine, but uh, it was weird to not see them take advantage of opportunities and make things difficult for themselves and have to earn all those points just a really difficult way when they didn't need to. Yeah. And this is, it's, it's not like the offense did poorly. It just, it, it didn't convert. It was just, it was just kind of odd to see. And even ignoring Dan Bailey's mixed extra point, which... Really, just right. Uh, yeah, they should have had like forty-seven points or whatever. Which yeah. again, weird thing to complain about. <laughs> you, you only got thirty-nine. Why? Why not forty-six? I am confused. <laughs> um. So Cook was doing fairly well and ended up having to go out due to injury, as we talked about earlier. And then Boone came in, and Boone did fairly well. 
I say fairly yeah, well for a man who got two touchdowns. Right. Uh, his his first two touches were whatever, but then after that, <laughs> it was not bad. Um, it's interesting, right? Because uh, at the center of this discussion surrounding Dalvin Cook uh, and his injuries is this question about the contract. At the center of the question about his contract, of course, is a question about, you know, are running backs worth it? Do they generate a lot of their own yards? And from the eye test, it certainly seems like Dalvin Cook generates a lot of his own yards. But Mike Boone uh, has built on the case that Alexander Madison built on, which is the reason that Mike Boone was playing because Alexander Madison was out with an ankle injury that didn't show up until uh, Tuesday practice, I want to say. Um, but yeah, uh, Boone has 56 yards on 13 attempts, two touchdowns. Uh, and what's interesting is that when you say, you know, Boone has uh, ha- had a good day. Uh, he had like two touchdowns and stuff like that. Given the type of player he is, given, you know, what we saw in the preseason from him, given his player profile, you know, he wasn't a particularly productive running back at Cincinnati. You'd expect, you know, uh, the majority of those yards to come on like big explosive runs of like 20 yards. And he just kind of has some some middling production after that. Uh, no, his longest game was like 10 yards. He was really consistent. Um, which is really great to see. And, and again, two touchdowns, not bad. Um, but yeah, uh, Boone, I think, helps kind of build on this case that the least important part of this rushing attack is the running back. Um, or at least, I shouldn't say that, because I would imagine like an individual center matters less than an individual running back or something like that. But certainly the running back is not pulling as much as the typical running back contract value demands in terms of running back production and they, and they seem to have very little effect. So um, Boone had a really great game. Maybe that's more evidence that the Vikings uh, shouldn't uh, go out of their way to pay cook much less, you know, this injury thing. So yeah, but it, it was really good to see because, you know, he's a guy that I think people have been pretty excited about for the last couple of years. Uh, and he hasn't had a lot of opportunity, which it's difficult to complain about that, but you know, it would have been nice to see him a little bit more in the Latavius Murray years when he was taken over for Dalvin Cook. But, you know, I, I get it. Um, and, and so when he had that opportunity, seeing him kind of perform the way he did was great. Yeah. And we covered how Thielen, uh, Thielen looked. He looked healthy. He looked like he was uh, at the speed that he should have been. And then Diggs was doing quite well for himself, uh, making a couple of, well, I mean, the bomb to Diggs was, was fantastic. And it seemed like he had all day to wait for that. But Diggs was also making some pretty good uh, sideline catches as well. Yeah, it, it would it would have been so nice just to add from just a resume perspective, the one that uh, he ended up uh, catching out of bounds because and normally he has just such phenomenal sideline awareness that you expect him to make that and, and have that be a catch. The Vikings, to their credit, at least tried lining up and snapping the ball this time. <laughs> but uh, it was the, a bit out of character. <laughs> yes. Uh, what, maybe that was the clue, right? Uh, maybe they should have taken their time again. And the rest would have been like, yeah, well, they don't seem that concerned. I don't see what the issue is. But no, um, the rest didn't let him get away with that one. But, you know, that would have been like uh, five for six for 100 yards, I think, instead of four for six for 76. Um, but yeah, before that, he had 30 yards and three receptions, 10 yards of reception. Fairly typical last year digs, but that deep bomb evens it out. Uh, obviously, the Vikings didn't have to throw the ball a ton. They only threw the ball 25 times. And a lot of it was because, you know, third downs kind of forced it. They were very content running the ball with the crazy amounts of lead that they were able to generate mostly because of the defense until late. Um, but yeah, it, w- it was nice to see uh, Diggs had uh, maybe a quiet 70 plus yard game. You typically, you know, talk more about it, but um, yeah, he was able to get up a deep. That was nice to see. Uh, he had, like you said, a couple of sideline catches, a bunch of difficult catches, six targets, four receptions, uh, fairly normal outing, except you know, uh, for the fact that we've seen him double that, uh, at least I think in a couple of games this season. So uh, it's been very easy to just become bored to really high level efforts. And Cousins seemed to do fairly well. And the offensive line did a really good job at keeping him upright and uh, not being touched uh, very, very often, despite the fact that I, I feel like we have to talk about the sweaty ball situation um, or at least the two uh, bungled snaps that Cousins Rip had issues. to figure out. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think both were under center, so there were there were there were snap exchange issues. Um, 
we had a lot of discussion about Garrett Bradbury in the offseason and how the particulars of his situation might make snap exchanges a little bit more difficult. Um, but which I, I don't, it's difficult to tell from what we, we see in the broadcast, uh, what causes it. But, you know, there was a, there was an issue at the beginning of the year with snap exchanges too. Uh, and so seeing that come back is, is frustrating. Um, but yeah, uh, Cousins had a fine day. You know, he, he threw his first, uh, you know, at fault, I guess, interception since week two. Although, in fairness, uh, he probably should have gotten intercepted last week, but uh, Garrett Bradbury caught that. So, you know, Bradbury taketh, giveth. Um, <laughs> like a negative reception. I, you know, probably should have dropped it, but yeah. fine, fine. Uh, but yeah, he should have had an interception last week. He, he gets it this week. Um, that's like the fourth turnover throw, turnover worthy throw that he's made all year, which, I mean, again, back to the Aaron Rodgers point, if we're giving credit for Rodgers for avoiding all of these picks, man, not going to give Cousins credit for having like four picks this year or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, okay, fine. Whatever. Uh, Cousins had, uh, for him, uh, given kind of the, the past two months that he's been having a relatively muted showing, um, but still, uh, what did he average? Eight yards in attempt? Is that 207 yards on, on, on 25? Uh, yeah, 8.3 yards in attempt. So, uh, really good there, plus that touchdown, um, to, uh, to Irv Smith, which was actually pretty good. Uh, the interception, uh, again, which, I mean, that one wasn't like egregiously his fault, like the, the Lions one would have been because, uh, Melvin Ingram made like a really incredible play and he was able to kind of slow play Riley Reef, um, into thinking he was rushing it, it was it was good it was really good um but again you know that 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 at least is is the fault of of cousins instead of a bouncing off a receiver namely Diggs. um so yeah uh pretty good not great day from kirk cousins um yeah it, i mean this is a, a a phenomenal defensive game and a pretty good offensive game and i think uh we i'm not i'm not gonna say we wanted to see it we always want to see every unit perform well but it was useful and valuable to see, uh, you know, a game where the offense didn't perform and the Vikings still kind of blew them out of the water uh, just because we've had so many questions about this defense for the entire year and about whether or not it could hold up in a situation where the offense wasn't pulling it, it, its weight. And at least in in this instance, there, there's that. And I would say, again, that the defense has changed really dramatically since the bye in a way that's really helpful. Uh, and it's difficult to see that because... Uh, they played a third string undrafted quarterback last week. And then the week before they allowed 37 points. And so it's like difficult to be like, yeah, but they're good. Uh, but I, I think they are actually. Uh, and, and the fact that they've played, um, a kind of, uh, a quarterback with his best years behind him and, uh, you know, the second best Purdue quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the first one made the Pro Bowl, so maybe that's that's not fair. But but you know, uh, they they played David Blau and and a, and a you know his best years are behind him, Philip Rivers. And uh, can you say that the the defense is fixed? Then it's difficult from a points perspective to say that. But I think that the defense has altered its approach in a significant enough way for us to say that there's something there about their defensive turnaround. And I think that they are in the middle of a defensive turnaround. I think that this game is good evidence of it, even if. You know, you take like half of those turnovers away. That's still like a three and a half turnover game. Great. Uh, that's good. Keep that up. Um, yeah, I, I think the defense is, is demonstrating that they're kind of getting back to form, which is really good to see. So the big thing that came across on TV, and apparently it came across very well when you were actually in the stadium, is the fact that the it, it appeared to be a 90-10 split uh, Vikings to Chargers fans in the Chargers home stadium. And while this isn't necessarily a, a surprise to people who have watched Chargers games over the years, um, or, you know, over the last two years, rather, this was obscene. This was a ridiculous amount of the, of, of Vikings purple out there. So much so that when the, uh, during the first and second quarter, when they were looking for Chargers fans to, you know, to, 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 to get them on camera, you couldn't find them 
or it was they were in a <laughs> sea of purple. You'd see two of them, and then the entire section was all Vikings fans. Their uh, buddy of mine was at the game and said his entire section, without a doubt, was all Vikings fans. This seemed absurd. How do you? There's a difference between like not having like a home field advantage, and then this. Yeah, so we've talked this year a couple of times about the ability of Vikings fans to travel. We've talked about it in the Chiefs game. Obviously, we talk about it every year at the Packers game. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we've seen a fairly heavy Vikings presence at a lot of away games. Uh, but, yeah, this is kind of just a different level. I mean, it, it absolutely looked like a Vikings home game. Like, I know that we made a couple of jokes about that a couple of times. Um but it it did. Uh, the, I think so. There's no official official report, but uh, you know somebody came out and, and said that they counted, and it was like an independent media it was like not a blogger or a fan with an invested uh, interest in the outcome. But uh, you know, so, some some newspaper uh, tried to figure out the actual uh, proportion, and it was like 85 percent Vikings fans, which is exactly what you expect from like a home game. Um, so yeah, it, it was absurd. I mean, like the Vikings traveled well to Kansas city and they drowned out the Kansas city fans, which is fantastic, but, uh, they didn't even need to drown out the chargers fans because, uh, you'd, they'd have to be there for that to happen. Um, so yeah, it was photos. I think the LA times took this amazing photo of a bunch of Vikings fans celebrating, uh, and there's just one Chargers fan in the stand sitting down looking grumpy with his arms crossed. I was, I thought you were going to talk about the, the gif out there of the one no, that Chargers, was great too. <laughs> the one Chargers like, fan flipping, flipping everybody, everybody off. off. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> just sitting there just, really? This is... <sighs> yeah. I'm tired. Why the hell did I drive here from San Diego? This is ridiculous. Um, is there anything that we should take away from... I, I say take away from the corner play, but Mackenzie Alexander really didn't. It, it seemed like he was either getting picked on or he was just always in a bad spot. Kind of like to to wrap up the the coverage here. Um, he he's had yeah. a decent year, but this it seemed like Philip Rivers was just having fun with him out there. He's had a great year. Um, yeah, this game was his worst game of the year. Um, mostly first half stuff. Uh, got beaten over the middle. Uh, one of the receptions that I saw him give up, I think it was a third and eight. Of course, it was third down um, that he gave up. I think he was confused about the coverage. Uh, I think he thought it was uh, man coverage and it was zone. Uh, and so he, he got to his assignment late. And so that one I'm, I'm a little less um, annoyed by. I, so coaches tend to be more annoyed by mental errors. Uh, which makes sense from the perspective of of coaching, um, because uh, to hold players accountable, they're uh, you know they they can they can essentially choose to the degree that they can choose um, whether or not they make mental mistakes. But you know the the you know getting out physical or something like that, it's difficult to blame a player for that. Um, and so, from the perspective of a coach, it's easier to get more annoyed at a mental mistake like that. From the perspective of an analyst trying to figure out kind of going forward how good this player is going to be or can be, the mental mistakes are the ones that are easier to forgive because those are the most likely to be corrected. Uh, and so from my perspective, at least one of those, uh, you know, doesn't bother me that much. But yeah, I mean, he had a pretty poor game, relatively speaking. Uh, Mike Hughes uh, had a really poor first half. Um, and then he had like that really great pass deflection in between two long receptions that he gave up. And you're like, well, I don't know what to do with that. But at least he got the pick. Um, Wayne's had a good game. Uh, Rhodes had a fine four snaps or whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah. Uh, oh, and, and, and Holton Hill, I think he only got beaten once. So that was nice to see. Um, but yeah, from the perspective of corners, you know, the fact that Mackenzie Alexander had a bad game, means that the cornerbacks had a bad game because the outside uh, cornerbacks just haven't been doing enough to to give you a ton of confidence. But, you know, Wayne's played better, so that's nice. Um, but, yeah, uh, he, he seemed like he got lost a little bit in coverage, and, and you don't want to see that in, like, a player's, I think, fourth year with the, yeah, fourth year with the defense. And it's not like Xavier Rhodes was uh, lighting the world on fire before he again went to the sideline with an injury again 
Yeah, ankle this time. I I don't know. Um, so I was I was very last year. I, I was very um, dismissive, not about the injury concerns, but about people who were arguing that Rhodes was faking injuries um, to essentially point the blame at at something besides his capability. Um, which I, it seems to be the case that, that he actually just does in fact get injured that often, uh, because he had no blown coverage to like point to, um, he was, he was like grabbing his hammy. It ended up being an ankle injury. Um, but yeah, he allowed like one reception on one target to like Mike Williams. Cool. Uh, 16 snap, uh, 14 snaps. So he actually played more than four snaps. Um, which is a thing that needs to be clarified, I guess. But yeah, he was there. The reception he gave up didn't seem too egregious to me. It wasn't great, but cool. Didn't seem worthy of going to the sidelines, but yeah. So I, that's <sighs> why I don't think like he faked it, yeah. and I don't think he's been faking it. Like I think he just gets hurt a lot. So, which I think at this point is is like it's it's become canon. I think it's uncontroversial to say that. Um, but yeah, uh, it, the, it should be hope, part of every Vikings fans, like bingo card at this point. That, yeah, uh, if I was still making Vikings bingo cards, which I've stopped because it's uh, a little bit more mean spirited than you'd expect a, you know, quote unquote professional writer to put together. It's, ah, it's more, uh, you want me to do it. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, I that would certainly. You might even make it the free space. Honestly, <laughs> I forgot what the free space was a couple of years ago, but <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong at this point. But geez, yeah, that's... the free space. Uh, I think we did it in was it 2012? It might have been 2013. The free space was Christian Ponder uh, checks it down short of the sticks on third down. I think mm, or something like yeah. that. Um. But yeah, that, seemed, <laughs> that, that was a good one. That that seems sadly accurate, yes. Woof. All right, is there anything else that we should take away from this game other than the fact that the Chargers don't have a fan base? Uh, yeah, I mean, the Vikings are closer uh, in the playoff race. The, the, technically, the number one seed is in play. Uh, so for the number one seed to be in play, now that the Saints have uh, have won uh, their, their game against the Colts, um, the Saints have to lose to the Panthers in Week 17 at the same time, which I think if they do that and the Vikings win out um, and the Packers lose to the Lions, the Vikings get a bye. The other route to the bye is that the Vikings win out, the Packers lose to the Lions, and the 49ers and Seahawks lose next week and then tie each other in Week 17 those are the two passes of the bye. If that happens concurrently with the Saints losing to the Panthers, they get the number one seed. So technically, it's in play. It's uh, probably not going to happen. I, I would. I don't think anyone is like too shocked to hear that. You know, the the two top teams in the NFC losing, uh, and then and then two other teams just tying. Like that's a pretty elaborate scenario, but it's possible. I've put together a flow chart. It's going to be at the Athletic. Um, but it is certainly possible for the Vikings to win the division. Uh, same set of rules, except you don't have to rely on the Saints or the, or the 49ers or the Seahawks. The Packers still have to lose to the Lions, which looks like it's not going to happen. Uh, they have finally put Matthew Stafford on injured reserve. Not that we would have expected him to play in Week 17, but it's going to be the David Blau show against Aaron Rodgers, Pro Bowl quarterback. So... And they've Ooh. said aloud, like in front of reporters, not just muttering to themselves, that they will, in fact, be bringing back Matt Staff or uh, not Matt Stafford, but Matt Patricia this year. So, and they yeah, I can't imagine playing hard for that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and they are not selling the team to Jeff Bezos. They are keeping the team. Uh, yeah, that's um, got to inspire a lot of confidence. You know what? The- it's it, it does it does feel up there's a uh, there's a hotel that that closed next to my work uh, or is about to close and for the last three months they had a sign up in their lobby that said no we're we're still open it doesn't really inspire confidence yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it just for whatever reason it just doesn't inspire that 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 much confidence but but bringing back matt patricia let me just say as 
as somebody who, who who covers the Vikings for 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 a podcast, thank you, Detroit Lions, for once again, well, for keeping Best Buy repair or you know, Geek Squad guys off the street. Quite frankly, uh, because he might be forced to shave his beard for that next interview, and he does in fact look like a Best Buy employee. So thank you <laughs> so much for keeping him employed. Let's go to the mailbag. There's 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 a there's a perfect meme for this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is, uh, uh, oh god, no thanks. Uh, my not involved in human trafficking T-shirt has people asking a lot of questions already <laughs> answered by my shirt. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, let's go to the mailbag. Dylan asks the first question: Is it possible that Zimmer made a deal with the devil? to make Cousins a top five quarterback in exchange for his most cherished item, his uh, corners being able to cover. Monkey's paw. Man, that's so rough, man. Uh, he would never do that. He'd, he'd, no, like, if, if, if Satan himself approached and was not asking for his crowbar, um, mm. and, and he said, Mike, coach, Mike, sit down. I've got a great deal for you. Kirk Cousins will be a top five quarterback in the NFL, but your cornerbacks suck. You tell him to get the fuck out. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I, Defense I, matters. Quarterbacks matter. What is a quarterback? Come on. <laughs> We're going to start debating a catch now. I don't know. I like the I like the cursed monkey paw situation of your pass <laughs> offense will be amazing. Also, your pass defense will be terrible. Like I, I enjoy. Yeah, why so just, there's got to be a, a, a way to word that for the cursed monkey pot, right? Mm-hmm. It, it, it should be something like uh, the passing game will be more efficient, right? Mm-hmm. And but you don't specify, right? So you know, you, you wish ah, I wish the passing game was more efficient, and it turns out you've made both passing games more efficient. <laughs> <You idiot. laughs> all of a sudden, <laughs> all of a sudden, you seem to uh, all of a sudden you have gold everywhere, and you can't go to the bathroom. It's a damn shame. Uh, <laughs> Next question is from uh, from uh, MVF, Minnesota Vikings football Twitter account, who asks, is there any statistically significant advantage for teams who rest their starters uh, adjusted for seeding? Uh, so I, I wish I could find the research on that. I was, I was quickly looking for it, and I couldn't find it. I'll try to put it in the show notes. But uh, the evidence, I think, is scant um, in, terms of, in, in terms of whether or not resting your starters – uh, has an appreciable impact on play, but uh, some more recent evidence tells us uh, that I think uh, PFF Mu Timo Risk at, at Pro Football Focus found that coming off of a buy increases your chances of winning by five percent uh, on average, and I would imagine some of that has to do with uh, you know player rest. I'm sure another part of it has to do with the fact that you get an extra week to prepare, but um, from a player rest standpoint, I would imagine that some of that carries over. So, yes, but I'll look at, at specifically resting players uh, and put that in the show notes uh, over at the Daily Norseman. You sound about as prepared for that question as uh, Bill Belichick was uh, for dressing up today for his press conference. Uh, he was. He's, he, he had that fit figured out a week ago, man. <laughs> he, he set out his finest torn, uh, torn up uh, sleeveless shirt. Uh, sleeveless hoodie. It's great. Uh, Ethan asks, who is your ideal first round matchup for the Vikings? It's looking more and more like it will be the Packers, but who do you, who would you like to play? I mean, the Cowboys, it's not close, but that would require that the Vikings, uh, you know, don't win the division, right? Which, uh, is more likely than not that they don't win the division because the Packers would, again, would have to lose to the Lions and the Vikings would have to win out at the same time. Uh, and that first part of the equation, the Packers losing to the Lions in Week 17, seems really unlikely for reasons we just discussed. Um, so uh, if they're uh, the wild card, their options are probably to play uh, the Packers, who would be the NFC uh, North Division winner, or the Cowboys. I don't think there is any scenario where it is possible for them to play uh, the 49ers or the Seahawks in round one of the playoffs. And I think the only scenario where they can play the uh, Saints is uh, if the Packers are the two seed and the NFC West is the one seed, 
uh, or so- something weird like that. Um, but it is possible to play the Saints. Um, so I would say the Packers uh, are number two, the Cowboys are number one in terms of the the teams that you'd want to play. Uh, and then the only other team that you can play is the Saints. And I absolutely, I think that's the worst matchup in the playoffs. I'd rather play the 49ers. Um, the, the Saints just match up so well. Uh, their strengths are at the Vikings weaknesses. Michael Thomas, the best receiver in the NFL against a bunch of coverage players that, that can't seem to figure it out this year. They've got a pretty good, maybe not great, but pretty good defensive line. Um, and, uh, they do pretty well, I think, his, against play action in a way that the 49ers don't. Offensively, obviously, uh, there's just, um, I mean, there's just a lot going on. I think the matchup is really, really poor. Um, whereas with the 49ers, at least the quarterback is not that efficient. Um, whereas Drew Brees is like famously efficient. He, uh, he made 29 to 30 last week, but, uh, more importantly, um, the passing game is just harder to stop. And that's the thing I focus on the most because that is the most likely to translate from week to week to week. Yeah. So yeah, I, I, I want to play the, the saints the least I would play. I would want to play the Cowboys the most. Uh, and the Packers are not, uh, that bad of a team to match up against either. Well, no, but you also put yourself in a situation where, you know, their biggest strength is is Aaron Rodgers and passing the ball, right? And our biggest problem seems to be stopping the pass. <laughs> and, well, again, uh, and Rodgers is not having that efficient of a season. So. Yes, but if you find yourself in a situation where you're playing the Vi- where you're playing the Packers three times and two or you know two times in three weeks, you're going to lose one of those games. <laughs> it's no, I don't. I don't think so. It, okay, so here's the thing: Who do you trust to learn more from a game against their opponent? Mike Zimmer or Matt LaFleur? Still a bit of an X factor with Matt LaFleur, though. And there's I, I don't I don't he I don't think he's been coaching very well. I don't think Rodgers has been playing very well. Uh I I, I don't I don't like the scenario where you play the Packers includes at least uh part of a scenario where you lose to them in week in, in week sixteen, right? So if we take it as a given that you're gonna lose one of those two games, which I don't, but sure. Uh, why not have it be the regular season game and you win in the playoffs? Like if, if that's the case, I think that's certainly possible. But more importantly, I, I just, I think that, uh, Zimmer's preparation is better. I think, uh, the Vikings put together a more efficient passing game than the Packers do, um, especially against the respective defenses, but just generally speaking, um, at least with the Cowboys, Prescott has the most efficient passing offense. So that's the concern. It's just kind of everywhere else they fall short. With the Packers, I think part of the reason that matchup is so attractive relative to the other playoff teams is the quarterback, which again, it's a super weird thing to say, but between the players that are playing this year, between Breeze, Prescott, and Rodgers, I would uh, much rather play Rodgers. The only reason I picked the Cowboys over them is just they seem to be a mess. Uh, and so I would rather play a mess than anything else. But barring that, I would play the less efficient uh, of the of the quarterbacks. So yeah, I, I get it. It's Aaron Rodgers, but Rodgers has not been playing well. Well, no, but there's still just that there's there's still just that ex, ex, uh, existential fear uh, by the Vikings yeah, fan yeah. of yeah, especially like if it comes down to a hail mary. I mean, like who has faith in that? <sighs> yeah, let's let's go with that. HVAC repairman asks, "What's really in a hot dog?" Uh, you can watch the new episode of Binging with Babish on YouTube, and he will tell you exactly. What is in a hot dog? I believe it was 100 grams of lean beef cubed and 150 grams of beef fat cubed. And uh, just a little uh, and some curing salts. And that was about it. So you can go on to Binging with Babish and find out. Um, Kenneth Allen asks, should Teddy replace Rivers next year on the Chargers? They have the same wonky throwing motion after all. That's so mean to Teddy Bridgewater. They don't have the same throwing motion at all. <laughs> <laughs> no one has Philip Rivers' throwing motion. No, that, that is, is Philip Rivers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that the God, the shot puts were just no, po- let them have it one thing, man. Poetry in motion. Uh is there any evidence <laughs> is is there any evidence the Vikings flounder the week after big wins? It feels like uh in the example of the Bills, Broncos, and of course the two twenty seventeen NFC championship game, but I don't know if there's anything to it. Uh I feel like there's some soft statistical evidence that they do. Um after the Minneapolis miracle, I saw some people bring up the fact that teams seem to play a lot lower coming out of uh particularly big wins. 
Um, so like emotional ones, like comeback victories and stuff like that. Um, which I think the Bills came off of the week to come back against the Packers, which was not a win, but it was emotional, certainly because it was an overtime game. Uh, obviously, Minneapolis Miracle preceded the 38-7 beatdown in the NFC Championship game. Uh, the Vikings come back against the Broncos, 20 points, lose to the Seahawks. The problem, aside from the Bills game, is that a lot of these teams are pretty good. Uh, and so to, to chalk it up to that, I think, would be pretty difficult. Um, but, to, I mean, there's some evidence. I think that the... The biggest problem with evaluating this evidence is that teams that come back from behind are also teams that fell behind in the first place and so are probably not as good as the other team that did not, in theory, fall behind um, So, in, in their previous matchup. So I think the, the problem there is kind of evaluating that from the perspective of uh, what the expected outcome should be. Uh, but I am sure uh, that there's some gambling uh, podcast or, or article out there that talks about teams against the spread when they're uh, coming off of, uh, you know, a comeback. That would be kind of interesting to see. I haven't seen anything like that. I'll, again, I'll look for that in the show notes, but I was doing a little bit of looking for this before uh, the podcast and I couldn't find it. Next question is from all too human who asks, I recently heard on another podcast that statistically home field advantage is overrated and that essentially good teams are as likely to win no matter where they play. Is there any validity to this claim? Uh, I know that locked on had a little bit uh, to talk about this and the bill Simmons podcast basically opened with a big thing on how home field doesn't matter anymore and completely ignored the Vikings record when they were going through all of the other records in the, uh, in the NFC and AFC. So it is phenomenally overcorrecting to say home field advantage doesn't matter anymore. It is significantly less important than it used to be. I don't know why. Uh, there's a ton of reasons for it. Fans might be traveling better. The secondary market might be more accessible. Um, I, I think Warden Sharp pointed to like the increasing use of TV, but I mean, like teams still sell out the stadium. So I don't think that has anything to do with it. It's just maybe who they sell it out to. Uh, I think instant replay plays a role. Um, because refs, uh, are, are more likely to, to give the, a home team, uh, the, the call in, in, um, difficult refing situations and, in contested spots and stuff like that. So instant replay kind of corrects for it a little bit. It used to be pretty dramatic. And I know there's pretty good evidence that the three point, um, rule kind of, that uh, teams that are even on a neutral field, you get three points at home, um, is is overestimating it. Um, the NFL win percentage at home used to be 58%. Um, now I think it's uh, a little bit lower. But there's certainly an advantage, unless you're the Chargers, uh, of playing at home. Your point differential at home uh, remains larger than your point differential on the road for almost every team in the NFL. Uh, there are some years where it's like weird. I think it was like the 2013 Dolphins or something you know, or it wasn't the case, but that got corrected too. So yeah, it is better to win at home uh, or it is better to play at home. You are more likely to win at home. I think the advantage is closer to 53, 54% instead of 58%. Uh, I know Ben Baldwin uh, has a piece at The Athletic that quantifies all of the advantages one can accumulate in the playoffs. So obviously having the first round by is the biggest advantage because you've got a hundred percent chance of winning that game. Um, so that that's the biggest advantage, but home field is still a pretty significant advantage, and he calculated it in there. So I'm going to link that article in the show notes. It is certainly overrated. It is not irrelevant at all. Um, there's really strong evidence to indicate that teams continue to have a home field advantage. Do you think we'll ever uh, reach a point that Vegas drops the plus three or plus three and a half for uh, that'll automatically be given to the uh, to the home team? I think some books already have dropped it to two and a half, unless it's the Seahawks or the Patriots, then I think they bump it back up to three, um, which I, statistically, I guess, makes sense. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I would imagine the, the, so there's two competing views on what Vegas does. Um, one is Vegas tries to get, uh, as much money on one side of the line as the other. Um, in which case they wouldn't need to correct it if the public perception is three points. The other view is that Vegas wants to be right. Uh, and, and so no matter kind of what happens, they'll, uh, they'll make money. And I think, uh, people, uh, 
you know, quote in the know, sharps will generally tell you that actually the perception is the first, but the reality is the second. That Vegas actually prefers to be right uh, over getting, uh, trying to figure out what the spread is. But the way they kind of treat the the Patriots and the Packers and the Cowboys sometimes suggests otherwise. So I'm sure there's a there's a little bit of mix of both. But um, yeah, I, I think a lot of books have already kind of dropped the three points, and it's closer to two and a half. But you know, I, I I'm not as well versed in gambling as uh, even though it's got a really close relationship with analytics as uh, as I would need to be to answer this question. Yeah. Uh, John Belk asks, do you think the uptick in the performance of the offensive line recently is sustainable improvement that we can expect to see more of going forward or just some variance? On the opposite side, should we be more worried about how few pressures we've gotten in the last two games? I know we're really making them count, but having to convert such a high percentage of pressures into sacks seems like a risky way to live. Yes. Um, so the second one, I think, is actually a concern. That first one uh, doesn't bother me that much. Um, or it doesn't, I shouldn't say it doesn't bother me. It does bother me. Uh, I, I don't think it's sustainable. Uh, the sustainability questions on both sides of this pressure equation are kind of interesting. So the Vikings have allowed fewer pressures uh, over the past couple of games. Kirk Cousins has been throwing from a pocket with 30% or fewer pressures in, I think, three of the last four games. Um, and whether or not that can kind of sustain itself is, is I think, a fairly reasonable debate. Uh, the interior offensive line has not been playing well uh, despite that. So I would say Garrett Bradbury and Pat Offline have been having bad games for uh, that, that stretch of time, which is interesting because Bradbury had a pretty good middle of the season stretch. Uh, and it seems to have kind of reverted back to, to having pretty poor play, both in the run and against the pass. Um, but I would argue that it's not the offensive line that's playing well. I think it's, uh, the scheming that they do to get cousins into space or cousins kind of just away from the pass rush. Uh, and from that perspective, that is sustainable, generally speaking, unless again, you're playing a team that is willing to give up yards on the ground uh like the packers did uh and bite on play action so or bite on the bootleg uh and so um that's the concern i have i i think brian o'neill is playing really well i think riley reef is playing at an average level and i think that'll continue the interior offensive line is a concern but with the rollouts and stuff like that maybe that's less of a concern so from the perspective of offensive line play i expect that to regress from the perspective of pressure overall I would expect that to potentially continue until a team uh, decides that that's their goal. On the other side of the ball, yeah, I'm worried about it. Um, they are making them count. Uh, it is difficult to continue continuously make it count. Some players can do it. Uh, Chandler Jones continuously has, almost every year, low pressures and high sack production. Uh, I used to be suspicious of his ability to continue that. Uh, it seems to be something he uh, you know, continues to do and stuff like that. So uh, sometimes that works for the Vikings. I don't think that's necessarily the case. Um, but I expect that to, to bounce back too. um, just because, I mean, Daniel Hunter leads the league in pressures, right? So it's not as if he's got in uh, a lack of a capability to do that. The problem is the rotational, uh, ends like Stephen Weatherly in particular have trouble generating pressure. So when they get off the field, it's difficult to generate pressure. Everson Griffin's hot start, uh, has cooled off a little bit. So he's had a little bit of difficulty generating pressure. And then of course the interior defensive line is really bad. At generating pressure, unless it's a Fadi Odenabo in there, uh, which only seems to happen on nickel downs. So, that, I mean, that's a concern. But I think for the most part, that'll bounce back. Duke's Code asks the following question about your James Madison Dukes. Big win. Big win this weekend. Earl Watford has played over 150 snaps the past four weeks in Tampa. Unsurprisingly, the Buccaneers are 4-0 during this, uh, during this uh, recent JMU alums playtime. What percentage of the credit should he be given for the salvaging of Winston's career? Uh, 100%. I think um, when when Winston somehow gets that next contract, uh, I mean, you, you just have to, uh, he has to donate that to Earl Watford. Um, or, I mean, or barring GMU. that, the James Madison program, yeah. Um, so, that, I mean, that's, that's uh, those, those are his two options. <laughs> um, obviously it would, it would be very uh unbecoming of him uh <laughs> to not do that not that you know he's unfamiliar with unbecoming behavior but um <laughs> but you know it's 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 really incumbent upon him to do that because it's very clear that 
James Madison is the engine behind the Buccaneers' recent success. Obviously. Well, let's talk about your Dukes and uh, and NDSU, which I thought were on a collision course to uh, to meet in the championship, but NDSU played horribly last weekend. Yeah, there's a lot of talk about this freshman quarterback, man. This true freshman, he doesn't throw picks or whatever. He's got 25 touchdowns. Didn't see any of those touchdowns this last weekend. Uh, held to <laughs> nine points, uh, three field goals, just an awful. And okay, so Illinois State, right? And this is not the Trey Roberson, Illinois State. These are not the championship Redbirds that we've become accustomed to seeing at the FCS level. This is an Illinois State program that is on the rebound. They were unseeded heading into the FCS playoffs. They only scored nine points against this team that almost mounted a comeback against presumably, you know, the number one seed in the FCS, as if they can earn that after they've lost, you know, their other quarterback, you know, Easton Stick to the draft. So, um, I, I mean, they're getting really big in the britches about this freshman who hasn't been tested. Uh, and it's very clear, even in the play, like his first, you know, real big test in the playoffs, he just can't get it done. Um, you know, they, 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 they're pretty happy with their defense, but they've been giving up more points recently. Again, Illinois State, uh, you know, should have scored more, but they just, they're in a rebuilding year. So, you know, the, the Redbirds just don't have kind of the horses to get it done. Um, I, it's embarrassing for NDSU, honestly. You know, it, it's, <laughs> They, they look like a JV team out there, which normally wouldn't be surprising. They're playing in the JV division, but they look like a JV team playing against a JV team that's in a rebuilding year. I mean, come on. And they, they should just drop out of class to preserve their dignity. <laughs> really, just, just preserve their dignity, dignity. Just just drop out. NDSU played horribly last weekend and limped into the next round while, uh, while your James Madison Dukes chugged along. And I believe... Uh, I believe it was, well, it wasn't a blowout, but well, it, it might as well have been. Shutout. Yeah, it was a shutout. They, they, they had an in, infinite advantage over Northern <laughs> Iowa from a point of the infinite percentage more points scored. Yeah. So, uh, you know, props to them. I, you know, you always want to see, you know, kind of more points on the board and stuff like that. Uh, I get that, but I, I really think that uh, they're, you know, preserving themselves. It's difficult, you know, to 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 sustain. Uh, a, a playoff run. Uh, you shut out the opponent uh, and you sit on the lead. Uh, it's pretty classic football. Um, we know that they've got the horses to do it. They didn't need to pull out all the stops. It wasn't like last week against Monmouth where they had to pull out a um, a comeback victory. We know they can be explosive when they need to. They scored 60 odd points, 66 points, you know, last week. Um, so, you know, closer game. I understand. Uh, but, you know, my Dukes, they're, they're, uh, they're, I mean, they're, they're set up for success, right? Uh, they've got, was it, I think Weber State or something like that coming up. Yep. Um, a difficult matchup, of course. Uh, uh, not as difficult as, as the UNI matchup. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's tough. I mean, they, it's the, I mean, the reason you score 17 points is you, know, you sit on the lead. They give 33 carries to that running back whose name I can't pronounce. Um, <laughs> That is part it, of my favorite. That, that is part of the of my favorite part of this analysis is that they have a running back. You just can't pronounce his name. Yeah, it's you know, I, if if I need to, I can get around to it. But uh, <laughs> thirty three carries to him, twenty one carries to Juwan Hamilton, uh, the backup running back. Very clear that they were really just trying to sit on the lead. Uh, and and you know, more power to them. They played a smart, conservative football game against a team uh, that they knew that they could take care of. Uh, they did take care of that team. The opposing quarterback, Will McIlvain, averaged 3.8 yards per throwing attempt. Uh, the Northern Iowa rushing unit averaged 0. 0.0 yards on the ground. Of course, that includes the, the negative 25 sack yards because the NCAA counts sacks as rushing. Um, but it is kind of cool to say that they only averaged 0. 0.0 yards on the ground. Um, so, you know. Really phenomenal defensive performance. We know that that offense can explode when it needs to. Didn't need to. They had over 50 carries. Uh, they had 60 total carries if you include, you know, kneel downs and, and, uh, and sacks and stuff like that. So yeah. 60 carries. You didn't expect them to score that many points. It was really just kind of a slow, inevitable dominance. Um, still another great game for Brandon Polk, their star receiver. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's really great to see this. It's, it's very clearly, uh, James Madison's year. And when I say year, I mean decade. It's going to be great. <laughs> well, the, uh, your Dukes. They, they lost their coach, you know, right after the last national championship. And they still consistently, 
uh, you know, executed. So yeah. it's, it's difficult to take this away from, from a James Madison team that has just shown dominance year after year, despite losing their coach. Unlike NDSU, who has driven their coach off and has cheated their way into the playoffs year after year. So at 5.30, James Madison is going to be playing Weber State. NDSU is actually playing the early game on Saturday, which is kind of a surprise for the number one seed. Uh, NDSU by my Bobcats. Yep. NDSU is uh, playing the Montana State Bobcats. So it's entirely, it's entirely possible NDSU could be eliminated before a single snap of uh, James Madison plays. Yeah, I, I, can you imagine getting eliminated by the third team in the Big Sky Conference? Couldn't be me. No, absolutely not. Uh, Raul asks, who is the most likely Hall of Fame candidate on this roster, player or coach? Uh, Daniil Hunter, uh, or sorry, Daniil, uh, Hunter, Zimmer, Kubiak? Uh, I don't think Kubiak's making the Hall of Fame. Uh, Zimmer probably has to get two Super Bowls to make the Hall of Fame. Um, and then people will talk about kind of the way that he's changed defense across the NFL with the double A look and stuff like that. They'll talk about him as an innovator. That's probably enough to get him in. Um, you know, I don't think, you know, Tom Coughlin's going to make the hall. He might, but I don't think he'll make the hall of fame as a two time Super Bowl winner. So that's, it's not an automatic, but it helps a lot. Uh, I don't know if I would argue that two Super Bowls from Zimmer is likely. Um, which is not a knock. I, I certainly think Zimmer is one of the top five coaches in the NFL. It's just very difficult to win a Super Bowl. Um, I would say uh, your best contenders right now are Harrison Smith and Daniil Hunter. Um, you've got an opportunity for Diggs, and the reason I'm saying Diggs and not Thielen is because Thielen is 30. Uh, it took him a long time to break out, and so even if they're kind of equivalently talented, Diggs has a lot more years ahead of him. Um, but honestly, I, I think Hunter is by far the most likely Hall of Fame candidate, and I would have said Harrison Smith maybe last year. Um, but But Hunter having the most sacks of anybody before the age of 25 and therefore also being the youngest player to hit 50 sacks. Um, you know, he's on uh, a trajectory that, that would make it extraordinarily difficult to prevent him from getting to the hall of fame. Uh, and he's earning accolades too, which is important. Like the problem with Harrison Smith is that he's like missing some pro bowls that he should have had and stuff like that, which again, it's one of the reasons I care about this stuff. Um, whereas Hunter at least is getting enough recognition nationally that he'll probably consistently make pro bowls and, you know, in a down year, they might just kind of give him some extra credit in the same way that they give extra credit to, like, Aaron Rodgers or whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's probably Daniil Hunter just because he's probably going to break 100 sacks pretty quickly. Um, maybe by age 29, if you break 100 sacks by then, it'd be super difficult to keep you out of the Hall of Fame. Kyle Slaby asks, when all is said and done, do you expect to be more disappointed in the Vikings showing versus Green Bay or in the rise of Skywalker? Jesus. Um, <laughs> wow. Slaby went hard. Goodness. I, I saw some tweets uh, from people who, uh, because their movie reviewers got to see an early showing from Rise of Skywalker. I don't know, man. Uh I'm not looking super forward. I mean, the tweets were positive. I'm yeah. not looking super forward to it. Um, I, I would not be shocked to be disappointed. I, I think, uh, is it back to J.J. Abrams, right? Yeah. Um, for, I I loved The Last Jedi. I, I know that a lot of people really disliked it. Uh, some for like, stupid baby reasons. Some for pretty legitimate reasons, like involving like pacing and, and coherence and stuff like that. I totally understand. Um, but he, but Ryan Johnson's clearly demonstrated that he's a much better director than J.J. Abrams, who is a phenomenal producer. Um, but I just uh, the the ability to to like weave together plot threads and generate character develop like that's the strength of the Last Jedi is the character development. And I think the the way that they wrote Luke Skywalker um, was remarkable. I, I know people hate it, but I, I thought it was remarkable to 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 show the kind of vulnerability for uh, an established hero who uh, you know didn't even give in to temptation, just generated, uh, you just showed temptation, um, had a moment of weakness, which is like a totally normal character thing to do and had to fight past that and used that weakness as part of his own character arc. Um, which was a, a relatively unique character arc in the star Wars universe where you don't get unique character arcs. Um, I, I, I just think R Ryan Johnson is just incredible. Uh, JJ Abrams, just, I, the force awakens, you know, was kind of what it needed to be. Uh, it was 
it, it followed uh, New Hope a little bit too closely, uh, but I understand why you would do it. Um, again, I think a lot of people who who really disliked The Force Awakens probably do it. A lot of people, not most, but a lot of people dislike it for reasons that I think are are more being a baby <laughs> than than uh, the the movie related reasons. But I think there's a lot of movie related reasons to be a little bit uh, disappointed in yeah. in The Force Awakens, uh, and I think a lot of the same problems will be there for the rise of skywalker uh and also like what was that clip that was going around um they can fly now they can fly now they can fly now <laughs> and like i that wasn't great <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give the people who hate it that that wasn't great but this, it, star wars is kind of always a little campy um and and uh and so on but it is weird to to see um dialogue quirks that are like very specific to the generation that they're in. Like, I, yeah. I don't know. Was the slang in, in the original star Wars pretty close to the late seventies and early eighties teen culture? Like was, I don't, it didn't strike me as that. Uh, this kind of takes me out of it a little bit. It, again, the dialogue's always campy and, and it's not like, you know, return of the empire didn't have like a massive, a bunch of baby Teddy pandas beat, the ATATs and the forest problem. But, well, yeah, uh, that that being Return of the Jedi, but the you know, and if yeah, you want if you want a less campy version of Star Wars, just watch The Mandalorian instead, and you'll be you'll be sufficiently pleased. It's so good. I finally caught up. Um, which I mean, last time we talked about it, I was already caught up too. But yeah, holy crap! I want to see more Gina Carano. By the way, yeah, that, she's great. It's been really uh, that's that's been really fun. Although. I did read the tweet that uh, that said that Bill Burr in the Star Wars universe now means that there's a Boston in the Star Wars universe. <laughs> Dude, I was like, accent. is that Bill Burr? I'm gonna hate this. And but you know, he played the perfect character for him. Yep, so that was that was <laughs> that was pretty great. Uh, Don from Ohio asks, how long can the Vikings sustain averaging seven turnovers a game? Do you like their chances of winning the rest of the games if they do? Uh, to answer the second question, uh, yeah, pretty good odds. To answer the first <laughs> question, um, yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, it, it makes sense. Also, I would like to congratulate James and Arif on making yet another Norse Code Fantasy Football League Championship game via Arif's cat uh, at Eddie, Tog Eddie Crane. How does it feel, gentlemen? He's, it's, it's part of the extension brand, more of like the expanded universe of right. Norse Code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, just to consistently make it into the finals i I mean it really like it really i think gives a a, gives us something to to hold on to when we when we continue to talk and analyze about football like hey how much do you really know well you know in our fantasy football league we make it to the finals every year so (laughs) there's something there um i'm 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 glad uh it's it's i i think you know if we you know consistently lost games you know it just wouldn't provide a great experience for for people playing in the Norse code league who want to play against kind of the hosts and 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 make a game of it i think the fact that you know we consistently make the finals and and often win um <laughs> that's great and that's it's good it's not about the the ego or the pride of winning no. Uh, it's it's about providing the best experience for our listeners, and yeah. so uh, I'm really glad that we, as a Norse Code team, uh, made it to yet another finals. Um, cheering for Dog Eddie Crane, uh, temporary my cat. <laughs> darn, uh, darn shame. I, I I hope he's not going to bench his entire team now <laughs> for the championship, but. I suppose we'll see. That is going to be it for this episode of Norse Code. It went a little long since we did a little uh, discussion about the Pro Bowl, but hopefully uh, you guys don't mind that. Uh, Arif, what do you have to plug? I'm going to write about this Pro Bowl thing. I'm just too heated. Uh, <laughs> I had a before we were recording. I was like, I probably should write about this. And he was like, yeah, you seem to have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to do that. I'm also going to write um, about... Uh, playoff scenarios and stuff like that uh that's probably coming out thursday so that's all at the athletic all right sounds good well that is gonna be it for this episode of norse code hope you guys have enjoyed it uh please listen later this week when we break down the uh the rematch against the packers uh just a reminder aaron Rodgers has not won in u.s bank stadium yet 
So we hope to continue that uh, moving forward. But that is going to be it for this episode. So for Arif, my name is James. Please remember, uh, thank you for listening. And please remember that revenge is a dish best served funky as hell. And we'll be back later this week. Norse Code is the largest and only division of Norse Code LLC. You can find Norse Code on the Daily Norseman, SB Nation's Vikings blog at dailynorseman.com. You can also find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play Music Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are aggregated. Our Vikings blogger extraordinaire and generally useful human is Arif Hassan, and he can be found on Twitter at Arif Hassan NFL. I am your producer and co-host, and my name is James Pagoshnik. You can find me at the show's official Twitter feed, at NorseCodeDN. If you'd like to donate a few bucks to the show, you can make your one-time donation at paypal.me slash norsecode, or a recurring monthly contribution can be made by visiting patreon.com slash norsecode. Any questions or comments that won't fit in a tweet can also be sent to norsecodepodcast at gmail.com. On behalf of the Norse Code staff, we thank you so much for listening. Our formula is this. We go out, we hit people in the mouth. <laughs>